I'm a whore. First name is spelled S A R A H. Do you have a middle name? Catherine. K A T H R Y N. K A T H R Y N. R Y N. What's your last name? Burns. B O O N E. I say it at birth. 10, 10, 7, 7. Am I going to spend the whole night over there? When it comes to domestic related stuff, man, yeah. um, you'll, you'll probably sit in there for a day. Okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to lie to you. All right? You're going to probably sit in there for a day. Maybe two. All right? What am I going to Possibly. It's all up to the judge. All right? This is the thing is that the reason why they do that, man, is because when it's domestic related. All right, y'all are dating. This is still dating violence, still domestic violence. Yeah. Okay, they got to make sure they keep y'all separated long enough to where nobody's gonna come home and kill each other. And, you know, I, I know that, that might not be that might not be your intention. That's the majority of the, the majority of the uh, domestic violence and dating violence uh, battery calls that we deal with. That's that never happens. But there's always that one out of many that will do. So that's why they're gonna you'll probably sit in jail for maybe a day or two. Okay. All right, you understand that? Yes, sir. All right, just keep being cooperative, all right? Yes, sir. All right, so you want your phone? You want your phone? Yes, make sure, you, make sure you guys lock the back door, okay? We, we got you. Don't worry. We'll, we'll take care of that. You, you go by Junior, you go by George? Uh, George. Is it George or is it Jorge? Jorge. Jorge, all right. George. George. Hey, hey, man, I'll call you by your name. Well, you, want, you want George? Okay, I'll call you George. Thank you. All right, welcome. You need me? Yeah, yeah, just stand up for me. Face my car that way. The car is that way. Hands behind your back. For what? For battery domestic? Me? Both of you. I should probably not be together, but that's not my business. Yes, ma'am. So, stuff like this happens. And I have to step in. Why am I in trouble? Spread though? your feet. Spread your feet apart. Why am I in trouble, though? Because of Why the marks he has all on his neck and the inconsistencies that's of the story. Back. Okay. Because of the marks on his neck and the inconsistencies in your story. Where have we heard that before? So if you want to check out this entire video of body camera footage from July 25th of 2018, I'm not allowed to post links, but I can show you the channel where it's located. Sorry, that's the best I can do. Anyway, let's just get started on day two because it takes forever to edit these things. Good morning, ma'am. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Right. Miss Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black jacket and a white uh Multicolored shirt looks like some splotching on it. She is in custody, however, she is not uh, wearing any restraints. So we will be standing when our jury panel enters and exits. Morning. Are you still satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? Very much so. And are you still on board with the strategy that they are uh, utilizing in your defense? Yes. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. All right, everyone can be seated. Members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. I hope that you all had a restful weekend and then enjoyed your time with your loved ones, your friends, and your family. With that, State, you can call your next witness. State will call Dr. Sarah Zadovich. Good morning, doctor. Could you please state and spell your name for the record for us? Sarah Zadovich, S-A-R-A-Z-Y-D-O-W-I-C-Z. -A -A Thank you. You may inquire. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Can you tell us, what do you do for a living? I'm a forensic pathologist. And who do you work for? I work for Orange County. Uh, we cover Orange County and Osceola County. So tell us, what are your duties as a medical examiner? So we're involved in what's called the medical legal investigation of deaths. And that just means that we investigate certain types of deaths. And there's a Florida statute or a Florida law that states which types of deaths that will be involved in investigating. And in general, uh, they're deaths that are not natural. Um, so accidents, suicides, homicides, or deaths that are natural but maybe unexpected. Um, those are the types of cases that we're involved in. And again, that Florida statute lays out exactly which types of cases that we'll be involved in. And the reason we're involved in that is our goal is to determine cause of death and manner of death in those individuals that we're investigating. Turning our attention to this case, uh, did you perform the autopsy? 
Yes. And what were your findings as to cause and manner of death? So the cause of death, um, which I put on the death certificate, is positional asphyxia with environmental suffocation. And the manner of death, was, I classified as homicide. What information do you have <laughs> at the time that you began uh, that examination? So the information I had was that the decedent was with uh, his girlfriend and um, at some point in time in the night, he got into a suitcase, which was then zippered shut. Um, at another point at time, I believe she went to bed. Um, and then um, the next morning, discovered that he was still in the suitcase. And I think that was in about an 11 hour time frame from the information that I had. What can you tell us about how long George Torres was in that suitcase? There's not a really good way for me to give you a time frame um, as to how long he was in that suitcase. Again, because you know there was both the component of positional asphyxia, being in an unusual position for a period of time, and then also the environmental suffocation component. Because you know within that suitcase, certainly there's going to be oxygen, but it's not going to be the same as if you were sitting in a room like this. Um, and because there are those multiple components happening at the same time, there's not a really good way to estimate or say with scientific certainty, oh, he was in for X amount of time. There's, there's really not a good way to do that. Is there any good way to um, approximate or determine uh, the time that George Torres died? There's not a good way to do that either, again, um, because there are so many different components at play um, at the time. Uh, of his death, you know, sitting in a normal room like this, the percentage of oxygen that's available is about 20 to 21 percent. If that were to drop to 10 to 15 percent, um, and there, the person can be, um, impaired with judgment. They can be impaired with, um, activity. Once that percentage drops between eight to 10 percent, most people will lose consciousness. And at a percentage of eight percent oxygen or less, that's when we would expect the death to occur. And so again, there's not a really good way to measure the amount of oxygen that would have been available to him in that suitcase, in addition to the fact that he was in um, an unusual position. What position were you able to determine he was in in that suitcase? I wasn't able to see uh, what position he was in. By the time that our medical legal death investigators were at the scene, he was already removed from the suitcase. Um, based on some of the, the findings, um, I favor that he was most likely in like a fetal type position. So knees flexed, arms flexed, and the head most likely flexed forward. But again, that's from my findings. I, I didn't see what position he was in. What side of his body would he be resting on in this fetal position? That's that most likely his left side. However, I do say the caveat that some of the findings are dependent on time, meaning that, you know, if that suitcase had been moved or flipped over, um, my find the, that could be different than what I'm seeing at the time of my examination. Tell us, what is skin slippage? So after death, the body goes through a series of progressive changes. And one of those changes is skin slippage. And what that does is it tells me that that person is a little bit further away from the actual time of death. So it's not something that's going to occur immediately after death for most people. Um, it's something that would occur a little bit later on in that process of changes that happens after death. And tell us, what is rigor mortis? So rigor mortis is also called the post-mortem stiffening of muscles. And again, that's one of the changes that occurs after death. Um, most of the times that will occur before we see skin slippage. Um, but these changes are very variable from individual to individual. And it also depends a lot the environment the person is in. So for example, those changes that we're going to see happen more quickly in a warm environment. Um, as somebody who maybe is engaged in a physical or violent struggle, those changes are going to occur more rapidly. And then it also depends on the person themselves, you know, their, their relative size, um, their relative health. Those things can all impact the changes that we see after death. How does skin slippage and rigor mortis uh, inform your findings about 
how long George Torres was likely in that suitcase? So again, you know, the time frame that I had um, was about 11 hours just from the last time that he was known to be in the suitcase versus the time that he was found. So I'm basing it off of that. So about an 11 hour time period. Well, when I did my examination, the rigor mortis was already dissipating or leaving. Um, also, there was some skin slippage. And so um, if he had not been in the suitcase, if he had been out of the suitcase, I would not expect that advanced amount of change. Um, so um, it's compatible with him being in that suitcase for a longer period of time. It would have been warmer. Um, and also if he had been, you know, struggling to, to get himself out, you know, engaging that physical activity, those are things that are going to accelerate or speed up that process. So my findings at the time of the examination are compatible with that 11 hour time period or you know, somewhere around there. Additionally, did you note any injuries to the body of George Torres? Yes. These injuries that you noted to the body of George Torres, uh, did you document them on what's called a body chart? Yes, the diagram on a body chart, and we also take pictures as I'm going through my examination. So, ma'am, uh, on this body chart, uh, can you describe for us and point out what was the, the first blunt impact injury that you identified? So there were some blood impact injuries to his head. Um, I don't I don't think it's on this uh, one, but there were some blood impact injuries to his head right up here around the eye and on the mouth area. Did you uh, notate any injuries to his hand? Yes. So there were some um, ecchymoses, um, or you can think of that as like a, a large kind of bruise on both hands. What other blunt impact injuries did you identify? So there was a series of Echimosis on the left side of the back, which right about here. Uh, there were some on the forearms as well. And what was the height of Mr. Torres? Mr. So, yeah, so technically for us, it's length. Height is the measurement that's taken while someone is standing. So his length uh, was 62 uh, inches, and uh, his weight was 103 pounds. In regards to these uh, blunt impact injuries, how is it that you come to the conclusion that these injuries were the result of blunt impacts? So these are typical wounding patterns for blunt force trauma. And when I say blunt force trauma, that can mean something striking a part of the body, or on the other hand, it can be the body striking an object. Um, and that causes uh, injury to the skin, to the soft tissue, and sometimes the deeper tissues, depending on how severe or how strong uh, that blunt force trauma is. Are these uh, injuries consistent with a person being struck with a baseball bat? They could be, yes. Are they consistent with a person being pushed down a flight of stairs? They could be, yes. Can you say whether or not these injuries occurred while George Torres was in the suitcase? No. Why is it that you cannot say that? So they... they all, all of these injuries seem to have occurred around the same time, meaning that they're relatively acute or new. They're not, they're not things that are healing or something that happened last week. So they all occurred around the same time. But there's, you can't really look at a bruise or a contusion and say, oh, that happened two hours ago. There's not a good way to do that. Are these injuries consistent with, uh, with occur them occurring while he was inside the suitcase? Yes, they could be. As part of your examination, do you also check the toxicology of George Torres? Yes. And is that something that's pretty standard in any autopsy? Yes. And what were the toxicology results uh, for George Torres? Uh, so there was a blood alcohol level of 0.139 milligrams per deciliter, and there was also caffeine and nicotine uh, detected as well. That level of alcohol, is that uh, over the legal limit uh, in the state of Florida to drive? Sure. So for driving under the influence, that's a 0.08. So that is, is higher than that. What does that alcohol level at the time of your autopsy tell you about George Torres's level of impairment 11 hours earlier? 
So I don't necessarily know that it was 11 hours earlier, but it was at the time of death, at or near the time of his death. That's what the blood alcohol level was. So at that level, you know, everyone reacts a little bit differently to alcohol. And some of it has to do with whether or not somebody is accustomed to drinking alcohol or if they've never had alcohol. So you can develop tolerance. Um, but at that level, um, there's going to be impairment of judgment. There can be impairment of motor skills. Uh, there can be slurring of words, um, something that's called disinhibition or lack of inhibition. Um, and again, it's really variable from person to person, but those are the, co- the common things that you would see at that level. Would that level of alcohol impair the ability to problem solve? It, c- it can, yes. Okay, I'm showing you photo one from Stace Composite. Tell us, what is this a photo of? So this is the identification photo that's basically just showing uh, from about the level of the collarbones up. Did you note uh, any uh, signs of injury in this photo? Yes, so there's some um, ecchymoses uh, around the left eye. This picture, it's a little bit hard to see, but I think there's another one coming up. There's also an area of ecchymoses up here on the left side of the forehead with also some swelling um, associated with that. Um, the lips have some um, contusions and small lacerations. And then on the left shoulder here, you can see a little bit of uh, some ecchymoses here. Or again, ecchymoses are kind of like big bruises. Turning to photo two from State's composite, what are we looking at in this photograph? So this is his right arm near the elbow. Um, and right here, you can see this kind of darker area. So this looks similar to an abrasion, but it's actually... Um, it's what's called drying artifact. And again, this is one of the reasons that I think that he was in that suitcase for a little bit longer. Most likely that was an, a pressure point where part of that suitcase was uh, resting on his uh, elbow in that area. And then after death, that tissue dries out and, and that's the discoloration that you're seeing there. So here you can see a little bit better. Um, I don't know if you can get a feeling for this, but this area is what we call edema or swelling. So this whole area is edema. It's a little bit discolored, so ecchymosis. And then again, really at the corner of the eye here, um, you can see that darker discoloration. And so that's those are injuries from blunt force trauma. So this is the left shoulder and arm. So again, you can see this kind of red to purple area. So this is all ecchymosis and then a couple of linear abrasions or scratches. This is the same area, just a little bit closer up. So you can see uh, this whole area of ecchymosis. It's a little bit variegated, differential in color. But again, that's all blunt force trauma. And uh, what part of the body is this is the loving area? Uh, this is the left shoulder. That's the same area, but uh, in this picture, we have a scale or the ruler. And uh, why do we use scales and rulers? That's just to give an idea of how big the area is or how large the injury is. So this is the left forearm and hand, and you can see the area right here that's a little bit uh, red to purple, and then also right here on the left hand, right here and here. Those are all areas of ecchymosis, again, blood force trauma. Again, the left arm, just from a little bit of a different angle, so you can see, and a little bit with the elbow too here, but you can see all these areas, ecchymosis. And now looking at the left hand, a little bit closer up, so you can kind of see a little bit better these areas of ecchymosis. So now we're looking at the back, and you can see that there are these uh, linear um, abrasions in the mid-back. Are those scratch marks? For... They could be scratch marks. They could also be um, blunt impact, uh, more of just a straight-on blunt impact, especially being in that suitcase um, if there are objects in there. What is the discoloration that we see uh, around his shoulders and um, and then uh, and some other uh, spots on his back? Sure. So you're talking about this area? Yes. So that's called liver mortis or lividity. And that's one of the changes that we see, again, after death. And basically what that is, is it's postmortem, after death, settling of blood um, in the blood vessels. And so it's dependent on gravity and it's dependent on the person's position. So what I mean by that is we're seeing it on his back because after the time of death, at some point in time, he was more uh, positioned um, on, on his back. And the areas that are lighter, that's because 
for a couple of reasons. It could be the position of the body, meaning that it's not in the you know gravity dependent position, or there could be something pressing on it. So either one of those. So now you're seeing the left side of his back and also the back of his left arm. And you can see these areas here of ecchymosis, and these are a lot darker than some of the others that we've seen. Um, one of the things that I did is I looked underneath the skin in these areas because it's, they're so much darker and so much more dense. So I wanted to see if there was injury of the deeper tissues. So these areas are associated with hemorrhage or bleeding into the skeletal muscle, so the deeper tissues. And so that's just indicating more force applied to that area. And when you did your uh, internal exam, uh, did you examine this area and did that inform your findings? Yes. And that's showing those areas a little bit closer up. So you can see that they're much more dense. There's at least three distinct areas here. Um, that could There could be more than three impacts, but there's at least three separate ones that can be seen. This is just showing the upper back and the back of the neck. Uh, we've got a linear abrasion right here on the back of the neck, and these were the ones shown in the earlier pictures. We've discussed and seen evidence of many different injuries. In total, how many black impact injuries uh, did you identify? I can't give you an exact number. Again, you know, you can have multiple impacts in a very close area, so it can be hard to to discern each one. They can overlay each other, or they can be so close to each other. Um, so, but at least you know five to six, most likely more than that. And you also mentioned impact to the left side of the head. Yes, and I believe that was subgeal. Uh, subgaleo. So kind of similar to what I was describing on the back, um, I looked at the um, underside of the scalp. And so in those areas on the left side of his forehead where there was the edema, when we reflect or we fold the scalp over, there was hemorrhage or bleeding that was went through the entire scalp and was uh, deposited on the skull. Um, there was no associated skull fracture and there was no bleeding inside of the skull but it was all in the scalp and uh, deposited on the outer surface of the skull. So under the skin, but not under the skull? Correct. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Doctor, good morning. Good morning. My name is James mm -hmm. Owens, and uh, I'm one of the lawyers that represents Sarah Boone here today. Can we first talk about, talk about the toxicology? Yes. The alcohol. And you did order the blood alcohol test of the decedent in this case. And you, you said he was a 0.38. Uh, no, 0 0.138. 0 0.138. Yes. And you also ordered the vitreous level yes. of alcohol as well. And the result was a 0.213. Yes. And you would agree that's about, um, it's about three times the level. Close, yes. Now, you would agree that um, at those levels, there are some uh, pharmacologic effects from ethanol in the body? Yes. And I know you mentioned some, but you agree that, that that level of alcohol in the body would impair somebody's judgment? For most people, yes. And their decision-making abilities? Yes. Uh, and it would release inhibitions? Yes. And they would be um, more, more apt to take risk that they otherwise would not? Yes. And of course, it would impair motor skills and potentially loss of balance. Yes. It would also impair coordination. Yes. And eye coordination as well as fine motor skills. Yes. It also impairs memory, alcohol does. Yes. So there are lots of effects that ethanol has on the body. Yes. Now, you're aware in this case that George Tor Torres, the decedent, stepped into the suitcase under his own power in a game of hide-and-seek. That's uh, how it was reported to me, yes. Do you have any evidence to dispute that? No. Can you tell us when Mr. Torres drank the last drink he had prior to getting in the suitcase? That I can't tell you because, um, you know, if somebody had been drinking... <clears throat> either periodically throughout a time period or continually throughout a time period, that's difficult to say. 
So he could have stopped drinking an hour before he got into the suitcase, or five minutes before he got into the suitcase, or four hours before he got into the suitcase. Yes. We just don't know. It's Correct. Do you have any idea at the time of the autopsy whether or not he was in the elimination phase? Uh, so he was in the metabolic phase, yes. The elimination phase is what I refer to it as. But Yes. All right, now I want to talk about time of death determination. It's fair to say that you did not go to the scene that day that Mr. Torres was found. No, a medical legal death investigator from our office went to the scene. So there was an investigator with your agency named Ashley Hammer Hammermeister? Yes. That went to the scene? Yes. And she would have prepared a report? Yes. And you would have reviewed that report? Yes. Do you agree that fire and rescue assessed Mr. Torres at 1.07 p.m. on that date, February 24th of 2020? Yes. This investigator that we mentioned, she did not arrive on scene till 6.27 p.m., so nearly six hours after the body was discovered, she arrived. Yes. And the body was laying supine stretched out? Yes. In front of the suitcase? Yes. Now, you examine and assess the body of Mr. Torres at the time of the autopsy? Yes. And you said that the body was ambient temperature? Yes. Is that the, that, is that the normal air temperature we're in today? Uh, whichever environment you're in, yes. So the body was not stored in a cooler for 24 hours? No, the body was stored in the cooler. Um, but in the mornings uh, when we get there, the bodies are brought out of the cooler. Okay. How long had the body been out of the cooler before it was examined by you? Do you know? Um, most likely an hour to an hour and a half. Now, you said that the lividity was in the back, correct? There's lividity in the back and also on the left side of the body as well. And you agree the body is stored at the morgue in, on its back? Correct. Now, were you aware of the last time that Miss Boone, my client, actually saw her boyfriend alive or observed him in, in the video, in the, in the suitcase by video from the phone? I think in the report it was around 12.30 or 1 in the morning. Somewhere around. Have there. you looked at either one of those uh, videos from her phone? I briefly saw one that the uh, detective showed me. Do you know if that was the two-minute video or the 20-second second video? Um, I believe it was the shorter one. Okay. So would it be fair if I said the time last seen was around 1130, would you dispute that? or No. Okay. From the time, I guess it was 1130 that evening with the videos, and then um, you understood that the body was found around... 12 hours later, the next day or so, would you agree that uh, the, the death occurred sometime within those two periods of time? Yes. I we don't know exactly when that is. So yeah. it, it would be a guess if we tried to speculate about that. Yes. Now, considering the, the 3,000 autopsies, how many cases have you ruled the cause of death as positional or postural asphyxia? Uh, a handful of times. It's not very common. So about five times or less? Yes. And we're going to talk about environmental suffocation in, in a little bit, but uh, let's talk about this positional asphyxia component. What was your ruling in those five cases that you ruled that it was positional or, uh, asphyxia? What was your ruling in terms of uh, your diagnosis? I'm going to object this to relevance. Approach. The objection yeah, is sustained. Anything? Doctor, you're, you're familiar with Dr. DeMaio, Vincent DeMaio's textbook of forensic pathology? Yes. Would you agree that's authoritative or well-accepted book? Yes. Environmental suffocation is a lack of oxygen. You would agree? Yes. How many of those cases have, of the 3,000 that you've done where you found environmental suffocation? Uh, probably two to three. So very few? Yes. In a positional asphyxia case, that's kind of an example. Like you get stuck in a hole and as you breathe, you sink deeper into the hole or it, it tightens. It can be anything that impairs the actual physical aspect of breathing. So that could be if the neck is flexed very much forward, and so that way cutting off the air supply up towards the top of the head. That could be something compressing around the torso, so not being able to take a full breath. So those are examples of... of or another example may be falling out of a tree stand and getting suspended upside down. Yes. Or the majority of the blood gets in the top half of the body. Yes. Would you agree in those type situations that the deaths occur fairly quickly? Usually, they can. It depends again on the situation. Now you said Mr. Torres was five five two and one hundred and three pounds. Yes. Do you know how big the suitcase was that Mr. Torres was in? 
Uh, I don't have the exact measurements with me. So if I told you the measurements, you, you wouldn't know one way or the other what they were? You no, know, I think they were described to me, and I saw the pictures from the scene, um, and I was able to review crime scene photos to see what the actual suitcase was like. Okay. Uh, do you know the crown to rump length of Mr. Torres? No. Did you do any demonstrative study on the suitcase to determine what kind of spacing he would have inside that enclosure? No. And you don't know the position that Mr. Torres or his orientation at the time that he was in the suitcase was? Again, I favor a fetal position, <clears throat> but again, I didn't observe him in the suitcase. But you don't, you don't know exactly what the positional component was that, that caused or, or what led you to believe caused his death? Correct. I mean, based on his stature and what the suitcase was, you know, he would have had to have flexed at the hips and knees to be able to fit into the suitcase. Based on what you've said, you would agree you didn't know how much Mr. Torres would have been able to move and stretch his various extremities inside the suitcase, did you? No. You would agree that his repositioning inside the suitcase would have been easier if he, if he didn't have so much alcohol in his bloodstream? I don't know that I would agree with that. Excuse me? I don't know that I would agree with that. Well, you, you said his fine motor skills would be impaired by the alcohol. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you meant his ability to just move. To reposition himself inside this, that would be limited to some degree by the alcohol he consumed. It could be. I mean, that's not really a fine motor skill. Okay. Or, or the use of his hands to, to, to unzip the suitcase would sure. be affected by the alcohol that he had consumed. Sure, that could be. Okay. Now, the environmental suffocation deals with the lack of oxygen. Yes. Correct? And due to that insufficient oxygen that we breathe uh, in the air... So you, is, you essentially run out of the oxygen in the space. Yes. So I guess the years ago, uh, how this sometimes would occur was a child would somehow get into an old refrigerator and it would be enclosed. So it was airtight and eventually you would run out of oxygen. Yes. You would agree with that? Yes. And I think you said the normal makeup of air has about 20% oxygen? Yes. So we had either a decrease in the oxygen levels or a low concentration of oxygen. In the yes. yes. And also, you know, keep in mind that while he's in there, every time he's exhaling, he's pushing out carbon dioxide. Okay. So again, whatever oxygen is there is most likely diminished because it is an enclosed space. It doesn't have to be no oxygen, but it's decreased from, you know, what we, what we would have in a normal room. But every time that he's exhaling, there's more carbon dioxide that's in that space as well. So that, that displaces any oxygen that might be there too. So what volume of air do we inhale and exhale in a normal breath? It says? Well, it depends. I mean, you can take a deep breath, you can take a shallow breath. Um, it, it depends. And then there's also the rate at which people breathe. So that's variable. So would, if it was average, would you say 500 milliliters? On it depends on the person. Well, would you agree that uh, at rest, you take a normal number of breaths per minute of 12 to 14? That would be considered the normal range, yes. Six to seven liters per minute? Yes. Rest? Do you know the volume of room air contained in that suitcase? No. Do you know how porous the fabric of that suitcase was? No. Did you run any tests on the suitcase? No. Were you aware that the this, this suitcase, the the lock on it or the zipper on it was broken? The pull handles were broken? Yes, I did know that. Do you agree if, if there is a portion of the zipper that's open that air can travel in and out of that space? Yes. Do you know what the anticipated exchange of gases would be through that fabric? No. Do you know if, you know, the, the suitcase was out in the rain and it rained, do you know, you know, whether or not uh, rain or the liquid would, would pierce the interior? I don't know. So from what I, from what I gather, no studies were done on the suitcase? Not that I'm aware of. So we don't know that zipper being busted, what exchange of air could go in and out? Correct. I think you said um, there are physiological effects once the, the value or percentage of oxygen is decreased from the normal? Yes. You said 8 to 10%, you become unconscious? Yes. And then a value of less than 8%, uh, death occurs? For most people, yes. Excuse me? For most people. And the normal oxygen saturation in adults and children is 95 to 100%? Yes. So if it decreases, the oxygen decreases less than 10%, someone would lose consciousness and die within less than 30 minutes. So that that's hard to give a time frame on that. Um, studies that have been done shown that the oxygen 
you know, content is anywhere from four to six. Unconsciousness can occur in less than a minute, death within minutes. Um, but those have been empirical studies. Well, and I know that's, that's kind of, maybe you tell me, is that's kind of why you gave the, uh, the two different diagnoses, the environmental and the uh, positional, is because the environmental may have had an effect or the positional may have had an effect. You just, you're not sure, so you listed them both. It's not that I'm not sure. I think that both mechanisms were at play at the same time, and that's not unusual um, in deaths, is there can be multiple factors occurring at the same time. But you don't know the percentages, 50% for one or 70% for one, 30 for the other. You don't know. No. But you would agree in concert, if these two causes, the positional as well as the environmental, if they were acting in concert, uh, that would render a relatively short amount of survival time. I can't say. Just don't know. No. Is he actually suggesting that because this woman can't answer these questions for him, that means she's unfit to testify? Now, you, we talked about these blunt force injuries, correct? Yes. Okay. Would it be fair to the jury to say that there were no broken bones? There were no broken bones. It would be fair to say that the blunt force injuries on his body that the jury has seen here today had, did not contribute to the cause of his death. Not likely. And I, I think you didn't put that anywhere on your report. That it no. did not. I included it in my report. Um, I did not include it on the death certificate. As the reason or cause, contributing cause of the death. Correct. Are you aware that there was a baseball bat that was scattered in the evidence in this case? Um, I didn't hear about that until later. When is later? When did you first learn about the potential of baseball bat? Uh, that might have been around the time that I was um, sitting for a deposition, but I can't quite remember. I don't have the file folder. I don't know when I was deposed. Do you see, do you see the, um, you said they were <coughs> circular type injuries? Yes. And you've seen a regular baseball bat or a kid's baseball bat. Yes. So wouldn't that, and if, if you were to swing that bat, and hit someone, hit somebody's body, or hit a suitcase, and the, the blunt force, that would be a linear line across that person. Would be, would be line. It could be depending on the position of the body, uh, the position of the suitcase, and the position or how the object came in contact. What does is, what is linear, a linear injury mean? So linear injury is if you think, you know, linear, it's more like a line. Now, if you took the barrel of the bat, the very end of the barrel of the bat, and you poked into the suitcase with the barrel of that bat, would those spots there in this exhibit, is that consistent? That's compatible with that, yes. It That's consistent? compatible. But yet a close-up, same question. Uh, is, is, would that be consistent with poking uh, the suitcase, if he's in the suitcase at the time, thrusting the barrel of that, uh, the crown of that bat, would potentially rest those type in? Yes, yeah, it's compatible with that. Now, I want to draw your attention to the cardiovascular system. Have you, do you have your report? I do. Okay. You describe the proximal third of the left anterior descending coronary artery having greater than a 75% narrowing of the lumen due to its centrically placed firm yellow white fibrolipid atherosclerotic plaque? Yes. And is that pretty much verbatim with what you said in the report? Yes. And that terminology is synonymous with a single vessel high grade atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Yes. And in that location, it's kind of a classic location for what people refer to as the widow maker. Yes. Because of the location in that vessel that supplies most of the circulation to the less left ventricle? Yes. If you had a spasm in that artery, that could nearly totally obstruct the lumen and cause a fatal heart attack, could it not? It could. It could cause a dysrhythmia, yes. I'm sorry? A dysrhythmia or an abnormal beating of the heart. But that could kill him. It could. The lumen is the inside space of the tubular structure? Yes. That, and so that was blocked over 75%. It was, but there was no evidence of um, 
myocardial scarring. So um, when the vessels become blocked, you prevent blood from getting to the muscle of the heart. So there was no evidence that there was any scarring. Uh, there was no evidence that there was anything that happened acutely. Um, when that happens, uh, we can see changes in the actual muscle of the heart. So there were no changes um, suggestive of that. Let me ask you something. If, if he were to get out of the suitcase on his own and he would have passed out or fell asleep on the couch, and she would have woken up the next day about that time and came down, um, and he, he was dead on the, on the couch, um, and you did this autopsy, would it be fair to say that uh, in your ruling on cause of death, that that single vessel coronary artery osteosclerosis would be your probable cause of death? It could be, but you know, any sort of injury overrides natural disease if it, the injury is significant, right? So, um, you don't have to be a perfectly healthy person to have trauma and die. So, um, it's very common that we see people that have injuries for whatever reason, but also have a lot of natural disease. Um, but we look at it as the injuries override the natural disease because especially atherosclerotic disease, that's, that's considered long-term, right? So that's been going on for years and years. People walk around with that all the time. So what's different is that we have trauma, and so that overrides natural disease. And sometimes natural disease can contribute, um, but again, it depends on the individual. It depends on, on the circumstances. So absent the positional asphyxia or the environmental asphyxia, um, and he was dead, and you did the autopsy, you, it would be fair to say that you would, you would determine this was a natural death from an isolated coronary heart, heart disease, would you not? It would depend on the circumstances. And I can't speculate on this case because I know what I know about it. If you had nothing else, the widow maker would have caused his death. Or you would have to have assumed, have not, having nothing else, that that would have caused his death. I most likely would have given him cardiovascular disease. This ethanol metabolism that we talked about earlier, and there's a question about you believing he was in the elimination phase, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to say that, that George Torres, the decedent, was in the elimination phase since the blood ethanol was below the vitreous value? Yes. Given the vitreous value was a 213, is it justified in saying the decedent's blood ethanol level was at least a 0.213 prior to starting the elimination phase? Yes. And now you know that the normal elimination rate is, I, I believe, a 0.015% per hour? Yes. Is that, is that standard? It's, it's an estimate. And so we have a difference of a 0.138 to the 213. So roughly five hours of elimination. Does that sound about right? Yes. So in other words, you would agree there's a short interval where the vitreous and the blood are identical? Yes. And then the blood drops beneath the vitreous value as ethanol is metabolized in the blood? Yes. So is it fair to say, given the significant difference in the blood and the vitreous ethanol values, that the true vitreous and blood ethanol level had to be much higher than what is reported in your report? At the, at the time that he passed? At the time that he passed? Yes. No, this is reflective of the time that he passed. Again? This is reflective, the 0.139, that's reflective of the time that he passed. There's not, you know, there's not um, metabolism after death okay. of the alcohol. All right. well, let me, let me, let me, what I'm saying is he could have been prior to that time of passing, he could have, his, his blood alcohol level would have been much higher. It was at least the same level as the at least the two. Yes. At least, at least the two, one, three. Yes. It could have been much higher. It could have been, yes. Judge, if I can approach. You may. This is uh, defense composite exhibit for identification. Jay? Has the state seen it? Yes. <clears throat> we stipulate Jay into evidence. What was pre-marked as Defense J will be received into evidence without objection as Defense 1. 
So that's the left hand. Uh, so you're looking at um, at the at the outer surface of the hand, the knuckles, and three of the fingers. Yes. So that's the same, just a little bit further away, and without a scale. So now you're looking at the thumb and the index finger. And then it shows some bruising on the hand. Yes. So what you're seeing here is, you know, from the scene, um, our investigators put brown bags over the decedent's hands. And that's, I mean, we collect evidence at the time of the autopsy. So at the scene, brown bags are put on the hands um, to preserve any evidence. And so that's why you're seeing this, because this is a picture that we take. We cut the bag open and we take a picture to show exactly what the hands look like. Here, yes, there. there. Mm -hmm. Also up around the knuckle area. Yes. Thank you, Doc. Any redirect examination? Yes, John. You may proceed. You were asked um, uh, several questions on cross examination uh, about the alcohol level in this case. And uh, I believe uh, there was a term uh, metabolic phase or elimination phase. Uh, could you just explain for us um, what that is? Sure. So in the toxicology testing, there's two different levels that I ordered for levels of alcohol. One is they look in the blood to see the level of alcohol. The other is in what's called vitreous fluid or eye fluid. Um, and we look at both areas because that can give us an idea of whether somebody is metabolizing through the alcohol or whether it's still rising. It just gives us an idea sometimes of how close to death uh, they were when you know the ingestion of alcohol happened. But basically, the level in the eye fluid trails behind what we see in the blood. There will be a small point in time, as we discussed earlier, that they will be almost the same. But it, you can just think of it as the blood alcohol goes up, and then a brief period of time later, the alcohol in the eye fluid will, will start to show. So again, it's just to give us an idea of whether somebody is metabolizing or whether they're still, um, you know, the level is still rising or if they're still, you know, intaking uh, alcohol. So the result uh, in this case was indicative that George Torres's level was uh, coming down. Yes. And I think some of the math was uh, a little bit difficult to, uh, to follow on, on the fly. Um, but with that rate of dissipation, uh, would it be fair to say that he would have been uh, – in that suitcase for approximately five hours, because he couldn't be drinking whilst in the in the suitcase, that we're seeing this great decrease between these two levels. Well, you have to be careful how you interpret it, because you know the numbers that that I have from toxicology testing that's from one point in time. Right, that's we're collecting those specimens at the time of the autopsy, so that's only one point in time. It's possible, but I can't say for certain. All I can tell you is that. At some point in time, his blood alcohol was at least the higher level that we saw in the vitreous fluid. Um, so if, you know, the, the calculation of the five hours, that's an, that's an estimate because again, everyone's a little bit different, but I think it's reasonable to say five hours. Yes, that's at least, that's re within reason to say that. And obviously a pretty obvious point, but we don't continue to metabolize uh, alcohol after death. Correct. Would the presence of ob objects in that suitcase also affect um, the length of time a, a person may have survived in that suitcase? Um, I, I guess if there were a lot of other objects in there um, that maybe could, you know, occlude the mouth or nose, or maybe if that means that there's more, if there's more stuff in the suitcase, there's less room for the person. So I guess. Another variable that would also be present would be uh, the opening of that zipper, would it not? Yes. If the zipper was further open, potentially more oxygen could be uh, coming into that area. Uh, would that be fair to say? Yeah, there could be more oxygen coming in, but the, that's always the question is, you know, there was, it, would it be enough? 
right? Because you can still have oxygen there, but it may not be enough. And again, for kind of the factors that, that I talked about before. And there would be no way to know exactly how far that zipper was potentially forced open. Correct. I have no further questions. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Jill. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Members of the jury, I'm going to read to you some stipulations along with an instruction. When the parties agree that certain facts are true, that is called a stipulation of fact. You must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated facts that you must accept as true are as follows. Stipulation of victim identification. The assistant state attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr., and defendant, Sarah Boone, as well as, his, as her lawyer, James Sullivan Owens, stipulate that the identity of the deceased in this case is George Torres. Stipulation of FDLE report. The assistant state attorney, Dave Cacciatore Jr., and defendant, Sarah Boone, as well as her lawyer, James Sullivan Owens, stipulate to the admissibility into trial I'm sorry, stipulate into evidence at trial of the FDLE lab report authored by Carolina Benito on June 3, 2020. With that, State, you can call your next witness. Meredith McCaskill. I do. Ma'am, good morning. Could you please take a seat and state and spell your name for the record for us? My name is Meredith McCaskill. And it's spelled M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H-M-C-C-A-S-K-I-L-L. -L. Thank you. Mr. J, you may inquire. Thank you. Where do you work, ma'am? I'm employed at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Orlando Regional Operations Center. And is that also called FDLE? Yes, it is. What do you do for FDLE? I am a senior crime laboratory analyst in the biology DNA section. Now, in this particular case, you are not the analyst who examined the items. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Did you review the information that is generated by the instruments used by the analyst who did this work um, in, in coming to your own conclusions? I was the technical reviewer on this file, so I reviewed all of the documentation and the paperwork and also the original analyst report. One of the items that is said to have been analyzed was a DNA card. Are you familiar with what that is? Yes, I am. Can you tell the jury what that is? Usually it's uh, referred to as a DNA card or a blood stain card, and that's just a card where somebody can spot uh, blood, usually human blood, on it and dry it down. Then uh, the analyst can take a cutting of that stained area in order to generate a DNA profile. And is that typically the manner in which a decedent or a dead person's DNA sample is provided to the lab for analysis? Yes, that's a very common thing that we see in decedents. In reviewing the, the instrumentation data in this case, was the DNA profile that was said to have come from Mr. Torres, was there able to be a full DNA profile at those 21 locations developed? Yes, a complete profile was obtained for that sample. Um, was there buckle swabs um, represented as being from the defendant, Sarah Boone. Yes, there was. And was a full profile at the 21 locations able to be developed for the uh, buckle swabs represented as being from Ms. Boone? Yes, a complete profile was obtained for that sample. Were there also what we call unknown samples that were examined in this case? Yes, there were. And in this case, was there an unknown item labeled as DNA swabs representative coming from Mr. Torres's fingernails? I believe it was fingernail clippings from Mr. Torres, yes. And was there a profile obtained from what was represented as being a DNA sample from Mr. Torres' fingernail clippings? Yes, there was. And did it match either of the two known profiles that we've just discussed here this morning? Yes, it did. Which one? Mr. Torres. Were there any results indicating um, foreign DNA on this item? No, there were no DNA results foreign to Mr. Torres obtained from either set of fingernail clippings. 
Likewise, was there something examined in this case represented to be swabs or DNA samples from Ms. Boone, the defendant's fingernails? Yes, uh, those were swabs that were sent, uh, represented as being from her fingernails. Was a profile able to be developed from what was represented as being uh, swabs from Ms. Boone's fingernails? Yes, there was. And did that profile match either of the two known profiles that we've been discussing this morning? Yes, it did. And whose was that? Miss Boone's. Was there any DNA foreign to Miss Boone uh, on those samples that were representative as, as coming from her fingernails? No, there were no DNA results foreign to Miss Boone obtained from either set of fingernail swabs. Hypothetically, if, if two people are living together and are intimate partners, quite frankly, would you expect uh, the intimate partner's DNA to show up on swabbings from their fingernails? Uh, yes, it's possible that their DNA would show up if they're in close contact with each other. But in this particular case, after uh, reviewing all the instrumentation data, there was no DNA foreign to either of their fingernail clippers, both clippings or swabs from their fingernails, both Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone. Yes, that's correct. No other questions. Any cross-examination? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Once you develop a profile, are you able to take that profile and compare it to other possible uh, DNA on objects or items? Well, if it's a DNA profile that is obtained from a questioned item, we can compare that to profiles from known individuals. And in this case, an example of that, if an object um, from an unknown source, you could take that and compare it to a known profile. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And if you get a match in with that comparison, what can you take from that? Um, just that that is the DNA profiles are the same. So if it's an object, let's say like a bat, and there's a D DNA profile that's obtained from the bat, and it matches a known profile, could you make the conclusion that the that person touched or handled that bat from the known profile? No, I can't. There's nothing in the testing that we do at FDLE that will allow me to determine how any DNA ended up on an object or how long it's been on that object. Now, you said that in this case, what was sent for DNA comparison? In this case, there were there was a blood stain card or a DNA card represented as being from Mr. Torres, buckle swabs represented as being from Miss Boone, fingernail clippings uh, from both hands represented as being from Mr. Torres, and then fingernail swabs from both hands represented as being from Miss Boone. Those are the only items that were sent to your lab for comparison. Those were the only items sent to the DNA lab. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I have no further questions. Any redirect examination? No redirect. She can be excused as far as the state is concerned. Defense? Yes. All right. Ma'am, you're excused. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. State, you may call your next witness. No, a lot of Ma'am, good morning. If you could take a seat, state your name and spell it for the record, please. Uh, first name is Janella, J-U-N-E-L-L-A. Last name is Wadden, U-A-D is in Delta, A-N. May it please the court? You may proceed, sir. Where do you work, ma'am? I'm currently employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office here in Orlando, Florida. What does Sheriff mean I'm currently having you do? I'm currently, um, my current position is a digital forensic examiner. And how long have you held that position? Uh, I just hit six years. On February 23rd, 2020, were you called out to a scene? Yes. Does that happen from time to time as a digital forensic examiner, as opposed to your previous duties like CSI, which would always go to the scene? Yes. As a digital forensic examiner, we are required to come out on scenes if requested. Showing you E for identification, you recognize state's E for identification? Yes. What is said to be contained inside of that envelope? Uh, an Apple iPhone uh, Model XS um, with a pink case. All right. Did you do anything with that item while you were on scene? 
Yes. Um, I was requested to come out. I was informed from the detectives that um, the user of the device gave consent for us to download her phone. Um, so I responded out. And um, once I located the phone, I immediately started to um, extract uh, extract the data from, from the phone. All right. Um, can you tell us the level of extraction we were able to do on site with this cellular phone device? Yes, for this specific phone, um, we were trying to minimally get the user data. Again, the stuff that you got, you guys can see when you're looking through your phone, your calls, your messages, your pictures, um, your videos. Um, and in this case, that's the level of support that the, so the on-scene software that we're able to use is able to download um, from the phone, um, especially with, with having a um, password or passcode. Can you also extract data that has been quote unquote deleted from the operating system? And can you just tell us all about that? Uh, yes, it is sometimes a possibility. Um, it's not always guaranteed, um, but we sometimes have more advanced tools that can pull, potentially pull that, that data from, from the device. And then later, once we get that download, we can put it into that software and normally would uh, give us indications on whether or not data has been been deleted. And so if a particular photograph or a Word document or some sort of file has been deleted from the operating system, may it still remain on the phone device or computer device? Yes. It may still be uh, locatable with your software tools. Uh, that that is the hope. Again, not always guaranteed, but um, again, that's why we're we're trying to go in there and look look for that um, the data behind behind the scenes to see if we can recover um, those, those artifacts. Yes. Did you later do another extraction of this phone device back in the office? Yes. And tell us if it is different in any way. How your software or hardware was different in doing it at the office? Yes. In this case, the we use again a more advanced tool, um, which is able to capture the technical term is a full file system. Um, so we're capt capturing that whole um, filing cabinet, you would say, of the data stored on the phone um, with, again, the probability to not only collect possibly deleted data, but also your systems um, information, application data, like your social media, um, mes messaging apps, everything aside from your normal um, user data uh, like again, like your calls and messages and pictures and videos. What level of capture were you able to do? Uh, again, in this case, I was able to do the full file system back at the office. Um, on scene, it's the technical term is an advanced logical or logical extraction. Again, which is, which encompasses your generic user user data on your phone. And the level of extraction you did at the office does that encompass data that is outside of the operating system or in unallocated space? It can include that data, yes. Looking at entry 31079, can we just go column through column and explain what we're looking at? Uh, yes, the first column normally is just an assigned number, just um, like a line item number for the report. Because again, this is an excerpt. Um, there could be thousands and thousands of line items when you're looking at the entire timeline. Um, so the far left-hand column is just a line item number. Um, followed by a again the data data category for whatever data you're looking at. Um, in this case, there's there's a couple listed as application usage and then location location data. Let's talk about the column that has dates and times. And can you explain to us what UTC minus five means? Yes. Um, another column again we're putting looking this at a timeline, so we want to know dates and times. So we'll include the date and time of the data that was recorded onto the phone. Um, and this report was adjusted for our local Eastern Standard Time here in Orlando, Florida, so UTC um, negative five. And going up to the top line there, 31075, that indicates that there is a start time for the application com.apple.camera, and then going back to our original one, 31079, that's the end time. Can you tell us what that means? Yes, so Apple is very good about recording um, activity on the direct directly from your device. Um, when you open up a certain application, such as the camera, um, Apple is making note that you 
in this case, it's in indicating a start time. So you opened up your camera at um, 10, 21, 36 p.m. Um, and then you stopped using it, maybe maybe closed it out, or stopped recording um, at 10, 21, 38 p.m. And in this portion of the PDF uh, timeline, there does not appear to have been any videos or photographs captured while the camera was open. Is that accurate? Uh, based on that excerpt, I don't see a recorded media file. All right. In the surrounding entries, can we just talk about what I would unfairly probably call spam of locations? What is going on there? Um, again, if there's uh, usage, um, application usage, or um, you're just in a really good location, or your device is just set to record um, locations wherever you are, um, your phone is also recording that, that data as well. And in some some cases, like again, your your phone, if you have it set for your camera to record um, uh, your location when you take a picture, um, again, like when you reopen that picture, it'll show you, hey, you were located at you know twenty five hundred West Colonial Drive. Um, that's that data that's being recorded in the background while you're using that application that it might have that permission to record um, that data. What does instant messages mean? Uh, that's referencing um, text text messages. Second column, outgoing. Does that indicate there's an outgoing communication? Yeah, so it'll, it'll reflect outgoing or incoming depending on the recipient or sender. The next column, there's a one. What does that mean? Uh, that just might be like one one S entry, one message. Um, I don't see the the header for the the columns. So that one, I'm not specific. Um, I'm sure of. All right, and the date and time we've already explained. So let's talk about the from, paren owner, and then the participants. What does this all mean? Um, so the from section, again, if we're looking at the first first row of data, um, it's indicative that it's a text message because the uh, sender, it's listing the phone number being used to send that message. Um, and then for iPhone devices specifically, if you're communicating with another Apple device, it may also list um, the phone number as well as um, your backup, which is your Apple ID. So if it can't transmit that message through your phone number, it might default to your um, iCloud account. Uh, and in this case, it's listing, listing, listing both. All right. And if, for instance, the, the outgoing recipient or the incoming sender of the text message is in the contacts, would it show up with the person's name, such as Wancho? Yes, our software will display um, your uh, contact name as, as how you save it. And if there's no contact name, it would just show the phone number? Phone number or, um, again, Apple, your iCloud account. Videos, uh, 16499, capture time, what does that indicate? Um, so that is when the uh, video, in this case, it looks like a video is captured on, on the device. Let's specifically talk about entry 16520. Again, we've discussed that's an instant message and it's incoming rather than outgoing. So that means it came to this phone device? Yes. And over to the right of the date and time, which would have been 6.07 p.m. 30 seconds on Christmas 2019, it indicates that it's from a contact named Mo. Is that accurate? Yes. Then the contents speak for itself. Um, going down to 16522, an outgoing instant message at 11.31 p.m. 57 seconds on Christmas 2019. What is the content of that communication? Uh, the content of the message is hide and seek. I shall. Turning down to 17167, it's an instant message that indicates it's outgoing from this device on January 13th, 2020, 5.01 p.m., 41 seconds, and it's from what is a uh, paren owner. Does that mean it's from the device? Yes. What's the content of that text message? Sorry, what was the line, line on my number? 17167. 
uh, and bless you and all of you too. I'll get rid of him. Then the next three are also outgoing messages. What do they indicate as far as content? Well, starting with 17168, then I'll be better, followed by 17169, Ugh, and 17170, uh, Torres. Turning now to entry 31103, which is on page 49 of the 59 page PDF. Um, again, it looks like what we talked about before the com.apple.camera application gets opened up to be used at 11, 12 p.m. 40 seconds. Is that what this data reflects? Yes. And then at entry 31107, a video that ends up being captured as IMG underscore 1062.mov uh, begins at 11, 12 p.m. 45 seconds on February 23rd, 2020. Is that accurate? Yes. There does not seem to be any intervening closing of the camera application before we get to 31113. In that portion, I don't, I don't see that um, information. And then at 11.23 p.m., 03 seconds on February 23rd, 2020, in entry 31113, a second movie is generated by this device labeled IMG underscore 1063.mov? Yes. For everything you've done to me. For everything you've done to me. Oh. Fuck you. Oh. Fuck you. Oh. Stupid. Oh. This is my name. The word of. I can't fucking breathe, babe. There is me. Yeah. That's when you do when you choke me. Oh. Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, I can't breathe, baby. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. It's on you. Sarah. Real or handsome? Might want to give me for it extra. Because <laughs> I got it. Sarah. Real or Sarah. Sarah. That's my baby. Oh. That's what Sarah. I feel like when you cheat on me. Sarah. I Fuck you. you. Yeah. You should probably shut the fuck up. For the record, that was IMG underscore 1062.mov, now publishing 1063, same respective file name. No other quick questions of this witness? Any cross-examination. Good afternoon, ma'am. I believe you stated on direct that you were called to the scene and you were asked to do your analysis out there. Is that correct? At least a download. Download. Um, what type of phone was this? An Apple iPhone XS. And how were you able to um, get into the phone, for lack of a better word? I was provided with the um, phone's passcode. Okay. Uh, with an Apple phone, without being given that passcode, are you able to get in an Apple phone? Maybe not necessarily unlock the phone, even though that is an option through some of our advanced tools that is supported. Um, 
but it can have the ability to download the phone even in a locked state and pull 80, 85% of that data. Is it a much easier process when you have the code? It's quicker, yes. And how were you provided that code? Um, I believe either through um, Detective Copsel or Connolly at the time, um, or I may have um, asked Ms. Boone just to reconfirm the passcode. And did she give you the passcode? Yes, yeah, somebody did, yes. Now, on the first exhibit that went up, or when you're talking about the communications or the identifying factors of the phone, uh, one of the things that were identified is dates and times. Is that correct? Yes. Also, you said it would tell you if the source was incoming or outgoing. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And then you said it would identify, it could identify either by phone number or name. Is that correct? Yes. All right. on, the, on the examples that you gave us, who is the identifying name as to the outgoing on this phone? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Who is the identifying name for the outgoing uh, text or calls on this phone? Um, I think in some of the line items that were shown above, it was just listed as a phone, a phone number. Was there ever a name listed? A physical name, um, possibly in other, other line items. But in this, and again, in those excerpts, it's just by phone number. Okay. Uh, did you ever see the name Brian Boone? Yes. Okay. Where did you see the name Brian Boone? I believe in one of the iCloud or log accounts that was logged into the phone. Um, there was an associated email address. On any, on any, no, taking that, was it any other place where you would see in a different name as to the outgoing uh, other than Brian Boone? Uh, again, there there might have been other names listed in other portions of it. But again, in those excerpts, it was just either by phone number or, um, again, with the Apple iPhone listing, the um, I, iCloud account. Do you have a copy of the exhibit up there? Uh, no, not not on me. Ma'am, were you able to see that? Yes. There's a entry on 12-25-2019. Is that correct? Uh, in, are you referencing like the instant message, the instant message row? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, does it, as far as participants, what does that show you? What does it tell you? So it's listening, listing the, um, the owner in reference to the, we'll, we'll say the first phone number, um, eight six eight four. It's referencing that phone number as well as. Um, the Gmail account or iCloud account associated with the phone, and then it's listing a physical name of Brian, Brian Boone. Okay, so showing Brian Boone as being the owner of the phone. Is that correct? Uh, for that phone number and or one of the participants in that message conversation. Uh, have you, did you recall seeing any other, not, any other name associated with that phone number um, other than Brian Boone. I'm not sure I'm understanding the the question. All right, when you did the uh, analysts of this, and you would look for the participants and get that information, match it up with the phone number, uh, then in certain cases they will show you the owner name because you said Apple is very detailed in some of their yes. applications. So would you... Did you ever see another name associated with this account other than Brian Boone? Uh, there, there was another iCloud account logged in on the physical phone. Okay. But there was no like um, name name attached. There was no name attached. Now, when you when you're identifying these sources as being either outgoing or incoming sources, and is that basically telling you? what device is being used? No, it does. It's not indicative of a specific device other than we know outgoing. Um, the sort, obviously the source is the, the phone that we extracted that data from in incoming messages. It does not let us know if it, if the message was made through a 
Samsung Galaxy or another iPhone. Okay. What identifying information do you get at that time? In regards to like receiving a message? Okay. Um, in this case, or what's displayed there, it's going to give us the content of the message. It's going to give us the date and time that the message was sent or received. Um, and again, like in your phone, it does depict either through a small notification arrows indicating ingoing or outgoing. So it's just displaying that version in text up there. Okay. And, then, and then from there, um, it's basically telling you the number uh, that it came from. Is that correct? Yes. Like in reference to that top row, it's saying that that message um, came from that phone number. Uh, again, the top line item last four digits is eight, six, eight, four. Um, and then it's also listing the message participants. It's not telling you the person who sent the message, is it? Correct. Just the, just that it's originating from a phone number. So if two people or more people had access to a phone, you wouldn't, from this information, you wouldn't be able to tell who actually sent the message on any given time. Is that correct? No, I'm not a fly on the wall and I can't see who's physically typing, typing out messages. Thank you, ma'am. No further questions. Any redirect examination? Other than just your subjective interpretation, given the context of conversations. Yes. And if photographs or videos are taken during these conversations, that could be indicative of who is behind the phone device as well. Based on sound and visuals, that it is a, it does help. Thank you. Can this witness be released? As far as the state is concerned, yes, sir. Yes, you're on. All right, ma'am, you're released. Thank you very much. Thank you. State any other witnesses or evidence to call at this time? Not for the morning presentation. Okay. All right. Members of our jury, it is 1221. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break. I'm going to ask you to report back here at 2 o'clock. So after the lunch break, someone came into the courtroom and caused a scene. And I have no idea if it was some crazy, drunken Sarah supporter or what. The judge wasn't amused. I'm not going to allow any outbursts. If you cannot contain yourself, I'm going to ask you now to remove yourself. This is your one and only opportunity. If you cannot control yourself or there are outbursts, I will ask the courtroom deputy to remove you. Does anyone have any questions with, the court, with regard to the court's instructions? If you're wearing sunglasses, I need you to remove them. If you would like to watch the trial, it is being streamed live. You can head to the 12th floor, get off the elevator, and head to the um, south side of the building. See the sign where it says Judge Michael Cranick, and it'll tell you which direction to go. You can pick up the phone, call my judicial assistant, Anita Berrios, and she can give you instructions on how to watch this trial virtually, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I might want to end with, oh, God bless you guys. I'm still the boss of the city, so we got to work together and try to figure it out. Thank you, ma'am. And y'all heard what I said. It was just like, have a good one. Thank you. To restate the court's prior positions, if there's anyone going to have any outbursts or cannot control themselves, again, I'm going to ask you to remove yourselves at this time. State, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, sir. Sure. Defense, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, sir. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our panel. All right, thank you. You all can be seated. State, you can call your next witness. State, we call Chelsea Kessel. Yes. And good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Yes. It's Chelsea Capsule. C H E L S E Y K O E P S E L L. Thank you. You may inquire. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Whom do you work for? The Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? I am currently a homicide cold case detective. How long have you worked for the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Since April of 2013. And what positions have you held at the Orange County Sheriff's Office in, during that time? Um, so I began my career in uniform patrol, and then I uh, moved on to the sex crimes unit as a detective, and then I moved on to the homicide unit as a detective. How is it that you became involved in this case? So on February 24th of 2020, um, my partner at the time, Detective Scott Lowen, received a call 
Um, our team um, in the homicide unit, there's three uh, teams that have um, four detectives on each team with a supervisor. And then we have one sergeant. And so um, on that date, um, Detective Scott Lowen was basically screening calls for that day. And um, we were at the office and he told me about the call. Once, uh, once you received uh, the call on this case, where was the first place that yourself and Detective Lowen went to? We responded to the scene. And when you say the scene, is that 4748 France Court? Yes, I believe so. And when you responded to the scene, uh, who did you make contact with first there? Uh, the first person I made contact with was uh, Deputy Kayla Rodriguez. And was Deputy Rodriguez able to uh, convey you certain information at that time? Yes, yeah, she explained to me um, what had been said to her and basically what they have done. Uh, was the defendant present there at that time as well? Yes, she was. She was outside. And did you make contact with her? Yes, I did. During that time that you were initially there at the scene, um, did you walk the scene uh, with the crime scene investigator in this case? Yes, I did. And when you walk the scene, just tell us some of your observations. Um, so when you first enter, um, immediately on the right, there's um, like a kitchen. And then if you continue down like a very small short hallway, um, it opens up to the living room slash dining room area. And so when I entered, I could see um, the victim, George Torres, laying on the ground next to a blue suitcase. Did you work with the crime scene investigator to identify potential pieces of evidence for collection? Yes, I did. Did you also have an opportunity to speak uh, with the defendant in this case at that time? Yes, I did. February 24, 2020, the same now is approximately 1657 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. I'm currently located in my unmarked vehicle um, out in front of 4748 Brant's Lane, apartment number three in Winter Park um, at the Tealwood Park Apartments. And also in the car with me, my partner. Second like stop though. And um, in the front seat is, can you see your name, ma'am? Sarah Lynn. Okay, and your birthday? 101077. Okay. <laughs> so, Sarah, I know you have talked to some deputies. I know we had a very brief conversation um, just to reiterate what you told that deputy. Um, but like I was explaining, I would like to get a more further um understanding of what happened last night and asking more detailed questions. Um, I am going to read you um, your rights, but it's just because that's how we do things. Okay. Um, so you do have the right to remain silent. Okay. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Anything you say may be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before and during questioning without charge. If you cannot afford a lawyer and want one, one can be provided for you before questioning without charge. Has anyone threatened you or promised you anything to get you to talk to me? No. Do you understand what I just read you? Yes. Okay. So, last night you said that you and your boyfriend George were here at your residence and didn't really leave that day. You said that he went to the store to buy cigarettes. Yes. What time was that around? If you recall. Was it light out still? Dark out? Yes, it was light out still. It's still light out. Okay. Um, but he's the only person that left and he came back. Yes. I'm assuming? Okay. Um, it's right down the street. It's down the street. Okay. And um, tell me what, what you guys were doing next. Like, what what was happening? We had a bottle of wine. We painted. We drew. We did puzzles. Do you remember what wine you guys were drinking? Uh, what is What? Chardonnay. Okay. The bottles are in the trash. Okay. Sharing them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember like what time this was that you guys were sh sharing the bottle of wine, painting, mm -hmm. and puzzles? I'm going to say mm, four-ish. 
Okay. And was this before he went to the store or after? I'm sorry? Had he already gotten home from the store at this point to buy the cigarettes? Yes. Okay. So it was around 4 p.m. ish that you realized, and you guys were doing puzzles and art. Okay. Listening to music, enjoying each other's company. And all downstairs, upstairs? Where did you downstairs. Guys downstairs. Okay. Um, we usually sit on the back porch because we smoke. You know, I love smoke inside, so. Okay. Um, and who was here last night? Was it just the two of you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. No one ever came over at any point? No. No? Okay. We called his daughters on FaceTime. <laughs> okay. We are just literally just enjoying one another's company. Okay. And you guys share the phone that you have, yeah. correct? Um, okay. And the phone's located in there, I think, in the yeah. kitchen area. Yeah. Okay. Um... So tell me what happens next. You're painting, you're guys are doing this puzzle together. You obviously finished the bottle bottle of wine. Yes. Um, did you have one or two bottles of wine? Well, we had one previously that was maybe not even half full. Okay. But then... <clears throat> so you finished that one and then you had the full one? Yes. Okay. And sorry, what was the question? Uh, did, what did you guys do next after the bottle of wine? Like after well, we had the wine... We had the bottle of wine while we were having doing our arts and crafts. Mm-hmm. And from there, just we didn't, we were puzzled out, we were painted out. Mm-hmm. So, being silly, let's play hide and seek, which we had played before. Like, I don't know if you've opened the door on the top of the stairwell, like, he and I have hidden in there before. Like, just having fun and enjoying each other's company. Okay. So, I mean, that's literally all it was. And then the suitcase is downstairs because I was telling you we were going to do donations. Mm -hmm. And because it's not a very good suitcase, the... What was the question? I'm sorry. You were just explaining to me the night. Oh, he decided to hide in there. So... Being silly, he and I were sitting there laughing at it, like, with him in there. And then, so I didn't zip it up all the way, but, I mean, enough to where his little fingers were out there and whatever, but still having a good time and whatever. Then, I guess, I decided to go upstairs, and I don't know, I fell asleep. So... I woke up this morning, and again thought he was downstairs on the laptop looking for a job, as he usually is, and then thought, where is he? Is he on the back porch? Is he in the back room? Like, where is he? And then I came to about the suitcase. So I opened the suitcase. I took him out, stretched him out, started to do CPR. Where air was coming out, buzz, and then like whatever gurgle. So I'm trying to do CPR on him. Mm-hmm. I'm shaking him, trying to get him to come too, but I can tell by looking at him something was wrong. He's been losing his teeth lately and has been complaining about his chest hurts, which is why I keep trying to get him to go to the doctor. But because he nor I have a job or insurance, has been putting it off. Mm -hmm. So, again, so I didn't know what to do, so I called Brian, my ex-husband. I called him. He came over, just walked in, and then walked out. I grabbed my phone, and I called you guys. From there... Here we are. Okay. The first time you woke up this morning, did you look at your phone to see what time it was? No. Okay. Most of the time, like, I'll wake up, but because he nor I have a job, I'll usually just lay in the bed for a little bit longer because the house is clean. There's nothing else that we can do. Mm -hmm. Me thinking he's on a laptop looking for jobs, I can't use a laptop. So... Most of the time, I'll just stay in the bed and collect my thoughts and get ready for the day. So do you have any idea what time you woke up that first time? What time it may have been? I don't know if you guys have that. I'm going to say 11-something. 
11 something. Okay. Maybe. Is that when you finally got up, or is that the first time you woke up? No, that's the time that I decided to get up, because I figured he was downstairs on the laptop. So I right. can look for jobs on the laptop, and then it usually I'll clean, he'll look for jobs, or vice versa, where I'll look for jobs and he'll clean. Okay. So you think you got out of bed after 11 at some point? Yes. Okay. But we can't recall which time. Do you think you were up for, like, hours before that, or no. collecting your thoughts? Brian, <coughs> because I was supposed to have my sign today, okay. getting him up from school, Brian usually calls to make sure, hey, are you sure you're getting Lucas today? Mm-hmm. Because I've had job interviews. Right. Are you going to pick up Lucas? So after he called, like, maybe three, four times, maybe five, um... I finally answered, and that's, like... Do you think you were sleeping and missed those calls? No, I ignored them. You ignored them. Because okay. he's notorious for blowing out my phone. Okay. But I understand why, because he's making sure that Lucas gets home. Right, yeah, okay. And to do whatever he needs to do day-wise so he can schedule around it. Were you upstairs in your room at that time when you were ignoring those phone calls? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so not really sure what time you woke up initially, but you... We're upstairs collecting your thoughts. You figured he was on the laptop downstairs, so you were just getting ready for your day. Yes. You finally got out of bed sometime after 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. and had gone downstairs. Yes. Okay. Looking for him. And was couldn't find him. You looked outside. Couldn't find him anywhere. It wasn't in the bathroom. I'm afraid to make in the bathroom. But then I came to. And, and then we the and then you and then you called Brian. Yes. Um, he he came over. Came over. Yes, he came over. That's down the road, right? Not very far. He came over, walked in, basically walked out. You called my home. Yes, I had my phone in my hand. I just wanted to wait for him to get there because I didn't know what to do. Right. And then we arrived. Like I couldn't. I still to the. I don't. I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened, but like, my whole thing is the whole, like, teeth losing thing, and I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what I think. He and I were having an amazing time yesterday, like we normally do. No arguments? No. Nothing? Okay. And the thing with him, though, is, which is why we've been doing puzzles and artwork lately, is that he's been stressing out about a job. Of course. Crunch. Which we've talked about. So what I did was start having him do puzzles and artwork to keep his mind off of it. Okay. His ex-wife is all over him about sending money, which he can't do because he doesn't have a job. Right. So he was stressing about that. He's been stressing about the job. But that's why I started to buy puzzles and paint. To get his mind off of them, which is what we, I don't know if you noticed on the wall on there, it's all of our artwork and stuff. Okay. So I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, music, art, and playing with the dogs, dancing around the room with the dogs. I, and then decided to play hide and seek. Because we're always trying to outdo each other on where we can find, we can hide the best. How often do you guys play hide and seek? Gosh, that was... Maybe, what, the third time? Maybe. Okay. Is it a more recent game you've gotten into, or three times in total in your relationship you're talking about? Um, lately. Lately. Because, again, like, we were puzzled out, but we painted already, so why not? So you were downstairs hanging out. Um, do you remember around what time you guys started playing High MC? Honestly, I don't. I... Do you remember if it was dark out? It was dark. Okay. It was dark. But my thing is, is like when I spent time with him and I kind of, I tried to get him to start doing it, it I don't look at the clock. Okay. I just, I'm here with him and mm-hmm. we're having a good time. I don't need to know what time it is. Right. I didn't know if you were like on your phone, if you got a text message, if you got a phone call last night. We called his daughters <laughs> yesterday. FaceTime. Right. What time was that at? I don't know without looking at my phone. Okay. But I ended up, was that the would that be the only activity that you had yesterday in your phone? I called Lucas. 
I talked to Lucas. He's my son. Okay. But I always call him. Morning. No, it was evening. Evening. Okay. But I'm just trying to help you, like, um, remember, a, like, something you did right before hide and seek that would help you re remember a time or give us a good time frame. Because that's important for, you know, us to know. I want to be able to call the doctors that. I don't know, to be honest with you. Okay. <clears throat> so when you called your, when you called Lucas, was it before or after hide and seek? Before. Okay. And when you called and FaceTime his daughters before or after hide and seek? Before. Okay. And did you call the daughters first and then Lucas, or Lucas first and then the daughters? I I never talked to Lucas, but then we talked to the daughters afterwards. Okay. okay. And I don't remember if she called us. No, I know he called Cookie. But yes, he, we called her. What are the two daughters' names? Or just one? Just say one. He has three name. children. It's Anna, Cookie, what her real name is Destiny. And then he has a handicapped son, George. George E. Okay. Who did you call though yesterday? Who did you call? Cookie. And what is Cookie's real name? Destiny. Does she have his last name or some, something else? It's Torres. Yes, she remarried, but I don't know her last name. Okay. Okay, so you know it's dark out, but you're not really sure what time it is. You play hide and seek. How long do you get to play hide and seek before he decides to get into the suitcase? Wasn't approximate. Wasn't really. I hit upstairs in the shower, mm -hmm. and then came downstairs because I was talking about hanging out in the shower. Okay. So that's when he was playing around in the suitcase. So okay. because I we both thought it was funny that yeah. oh yeah well I'm gonna zip you up uh huh you didn't come look for me. So, again, it's a broken suitcase, but... What do you mean by broken? It's only got one of these. But because oh, I didn't zip it up all the way, he was doing the... You mean it doesn't have, like, the pull part? Correct. Okay, but it... No, has... it's got... I think it's got a... What do you call it? A paper it's... clip. Okay. So the zipper to it is missing, like the actual zipper that attaches to it to help you open and close is missing, but you think a paper clip was on it I said? There is a paper, I believe there's a paper clip on it because I know that the last That's time you used to like help assist you? Well, or you can just stick your fingers in there and right. yeah, yeah. unzip it yourself, which is why I did not zip it up all the way. Okay. So how much did you zip it up? I mean, I don't really know. You said his finger, he was, his fingers were able to stick out? Yeah, two, two fingers. fingers. Okay. Yeah, so I'm figuring he, he'll, he'll get it, he'll get it. But then I wanted to go upstairs and waited for him, and eventually I guess I fell asleep. I had the dogs in the bed with me, was warm, and then fell asleep. So you guys are joking, he's in there. Um, you said you could see two of his fingers? Yes. And then, <clears throat> like, you just decided, okay, I'm going to go upstairs now, or? Because I figured he would get out and then go upstairs and have intimate relations like we normally do. Mm -hmm. But I fell asleep. Okay. And he never came upstairs. So, again, I'm thinking he's downstairs on the laptop earlier today. Mm -hmm. And then, remember. Okay. So, is this something that you, do you guys play hide and seek before you have sexual intercourse, or do you guys just play hide and seek because you're bored and you're just trying to pass time? We were, yeah, we were, again, puzzled out. Can't paint anymore. Even started to purge some of the art that's on the, the wall now, so. I'm not sure if her battery died or what, but that's the end of the first recording. So the full recording is split into two separate parts. Here's the second one. Today's date is February 24th, 2020. The time now is partially 17, 16 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. Uh, my original, my first recording um, on a separate digital recorder, um, the memory became full and we could no longer record. 
Um, but I am in my unmarked agency vehicle with, can you state your name, ma'am? Sarah Glenn. And my partner, Detective Scott Lowen. We are outside of, in my unmarked agency vehicle, outside of 4748 France Lane, number three, in Warner Park, collecting a statement from Sarah. Okay, Sarah, just for recording purposes, because it did technically stop and I wasn't able to take, say the time that it stopped prior, we have not talked anything further, not on recording. Correct. Okay. And um, you do understand that you don't have to speak with me if you don't want to, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. <clears throat> so I think I asked you, my last question was, and I'm not sure if you, you may have answered or not, but my last question was, um, you guys were just playing to have fun and it wasn't like a, something you did right before like sex thing. No. Or it's just because it's just you were... just silly. Okay. But you do say that you are intimate. Are you guys intimate every single night? No, not every single night. Okay. But I mean, did you, did you think it was going to happen last night? Yes. Did you guys talk about it? Or you just no. assumed like, oh, we're probably going to have sex tonight. Yes. Okay. Which is normally after we do the puzzles and artwork and everything, <clears throat> yes. Okay. We were just having a good time. Okay. Just enjoying each other's company. And so... Um, Dancing with the dogs. Mm -hmm. At any point, um, when he was in the suitcase, did you hear him say, um, you know, please let me out? No. Was he... Um, we were laughing about it. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Did you make any jokes about it? Oh, you're in the suitcase. But I know you had said that you were left upstairs and he didn't basically come find you. Do you make any jokes about, oh, okay, well, no. now you're in the suitcase? No. Or, okay. But I'm assuming the game was over. Like, you guys weren't going to play it. You weren't going to continue to play hide and seek anymore. Like, you went upstairs and went into the room. Right. Waiting okay. for him. Okay. And you said you laid down? Yes. The dogs got in the bed. <clears throat> Do you guys sleep together in the room every single night? Yes. Yes? Okay. Okay. And which side of the bed do you sleep on? The. Like, if. if it's, okay, here's the bed. I'm on the left side. He's on the right hand side. Because I've got Lucas's pictures over here. He's got his kids' pictures over here. Okay, so you're so closer to wall. the door or closer to the other? Are you closer to the door to exit your room or is he closer? He is. Okay. <clears throat> so where the pictures of Lucas are on that side, that's your side. Correct. Okay. And is that where you slept last night? Did you sleep in the middle of the bed? Did you sleep on your side of the bed? I slept on my side. Your side? Okay. And uh, I noticed there's like one pillow on the bed, and then there were like three up against the closet. Mm -hmm. um, are those his pillows, and he brings them into bed, or what's? No, I when I woke up, <coughs> what I normally do is I don't know if you noticed the mice that we have in there. But this is mice. Mm -hmm. But I'll make the bed, Excuse me. clean the mouse cage, and then go downstairs. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is that normally I'll fix that upstairs and then I'll head downstairs. Okay. So that's, that's why those were over here was because I was trying to fix up the bed a little bit. Okay. Okay. Were they in the bed prior? Like when you went to sleep, how many pillows were in your bed? We only have the two. You have two. Okay. Well, it's the two white ones <laughs> and the two size ones when we watch movies. Mm -hmm. We'll put behind the white one and then the third pillow just goes... Between everybody else. Okay. Do you use one pillow to sleep, or do you use you each have one, right? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So you just basically didn't finish making the bed. Is my understanding. That's why the pillows are up against the. There's like three cracks up against the. Closet. Yes. They're like standing. Yes. yes. Okay. Because I'll move all the pillows off, and then I'll shake out the bed, and then put everything back together. Okay. Did he say anything to you while he was in the suitcase? I know, I know you guys were laughing, joking, but were, was any jokes made? Was anything said? No. Okay. Nothing negative or anything like, I'm telling you. Just like, anything that he said. Like, we were laughing about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I waited for him upstairs. Okay. And, did you tell him you were going upstairs, or? No, I did not. I just, I literally went upstairs to wait for him. Was the line... Was that was it all gone at this point while you guys were playing hide and seek? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Is it um at that at that point 
I mean, I don't know how often you drink, but would you both, would you say that you were under the influence and he was under the influence or? Well, I mean, we weren't drunk. Weren't drunk. Okay. We weren't drunk. I mean, we had a handful of glasses throughout the evening. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we weren't like inebriated where we couldn't drive. You could still, I mean, we were common mentors. That's what I'll say. We were, both of us were common mentors. Okay. You have to explain that one to me. I'm yeah, sorry. I don't know what that word means. I mean, we had our wits about ourselves. Okay. That's well, why he and I were playing. That's the thing, though. <laughs> this isn't a trick question. You're at your home. You're consenting adults. If you're drinking, say you were drunk. There's no law against it. Right. Nobody's judging you. You're at home. Neither one of us were drunk. Okay. We were just... I'm just trying to get Okay. That's what it was. Listening to music again, dancing with the dogs. Okay. Well, luckily his blood alcohol level will show us of the autopsy as well, too. So, you know, we have that as well. Um, there was no ill will between the two of us last night. Yeah. I'm not. When's the last time you guys have gotten into an argument? Oh. Maybe last week. Okay. Over just normal relationship stuff, or it's a little bit of everything because he has a stressing about jobs. Right. Um, he's it's been extremely depressing for him while he worked up here at the. It used to be an Ace Hardware, but Ace dropped them as a franchise because of how bad the store is going now, and mm-hmm. he. He thoroughly enjoyed his job and everybody he worked with. Okay. But it's between stuff like that and then, of course, we've got the bills that we have to pay. And I've been having to ask Brian, my former husband, for money to pay for electricity and hot water for Lucas and groceries. Okay. okay. So I think that of course, because he can't support me, has been bothering him, which again, which is why I bought a new puzzle for the two of us to do. Right. And that's what we were working on in the painting. Okay. Do you guys um, normally argue often, not often, weekly, every other? It all depends on like if he had a good day or a bad day kind of thing, where he would just be happy to come home and see me because he knows that it's going to get better. And then most of the time he would go for a drink and we would sit on the back porch. He would tell me about his day mm-hmm. and we would have a glass of sip or glass of wine and then kind of start our evening ish kind of thing. And he smokes, but then we would go inside because we're tired of being outside. And then that's when we started to do the art and puzzles. And then listening to music and playing with the dogs. And it's a thing, tag and great kind of thing. Gotcha. Is there anything he drinks specifically, like his go to drink, or? It's honestly whatever it is we can afford. Okay. Which is why we used to drink, like liquor, but right. like months ago. Right. Which is why we have the wine. Wine. Okay. What did you guys make for dinner last night? He made a pork sandwich with cheese, and what was it that I made? I think it was a sandwich okay. and some chips. You guys have got to go out and get anything? You know, this is okay? Yes. Like a sandwich, or like a deli sandwich, like deli meat sandwich, or do you think you had pork ham? Like he had a, I made a pork one the other day for me, <laughs> him, and Lucas, mm-hmm. and there were leftovers, so he he had that. He made a pork loin sandwich with cheese, and I had my, there's ham and the ham sandwich with chips. Okay. Does he normally come up with that, or would he do the typical guy thing where he's downstairs and will fall asleep on the couch? I mean, he's done that before just because of his crappy day that he had, but yes, we sleep in the same bed. You normally sleep yes. in the same bed. Do you guys go to bed at the same time? Okay. Most of the time, yes. But because he's been very 
excited about looking for a job. He might stay downstairs for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then would come upstairs and he and I would watch movies together until it was just, okay, they're not, there's no more movies that we want to watch. And then we would just turn the lights off and go to sleep. Last night when um, you said you went upstairs, do you have like a ritual that you do prior to going to bed? Like do you brush your teeth, wash your, wash your face, put on TV? Is there any like normal things that you do? Me and myself? Mm -hmm. um, no, um, yeah, I'll go upstairs and maybe like rinse my mouth out with Listerine. Okay. Do you recall what you did last night? I just got in the bed with the dogs. <laughs> okay. Waiting for him. And how long do you think you were up waiting for him until you passed uh, out? I don't, I wouldn't say I necessarily passed out. Oh, I, yes. He knows too that I'll go upstairs sometime because of how tired I am, mm -hmm. which is why he'll just give me my space a little bit. Maybe I'll watch a show and then he'll come upstairs. So, I mean, Well, I gotta be ordinary. No, I know, but last night, how long do you think it was prior to you falling asleep? Oh. Like, how long did you wait up for him? Um, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I mean, I, I, I literally, I dozed off, warm in the bed with the dogs, waiting for him. Okay. Okay. I didn't even bother turning the TV on. Just got in the bed. He knows too, but I, I would go upstairs because of how tired I am. He knows. Like, I'm mentally exhausted. So. Who's the, who usually gets up first? I mean, are you an early riser? Or is he an early riser? He or is he usually an early riser? Yeah, he has to be at work by 8 o'clock, so. He would usually wake up at like 6.30ish if I don't have Lucas. How long has he been out of work? Um, gosh, maybe, well, he did some odd job stuff up there. But I think his last day was like Friday two weeks ago. So he hasn't worked in about two weeks? Yes. And during that two week period, has he maintained just his body naturally wakes up early, or does Yes, it's his early? body clock. Okay. What time is that normally? Like 6.30, 6.45-ish. Six but again, if I have Lucas here, we, I have to take him to school, so we're up at like 6.30. I'm feeling really like weird, guys. Like lightheaded. All right. I feel really weird right now. <clears throat> Do you feel like you're sick? No, I'm not sick, just... I... I don't know. Do you need food? I haven't, I haven't even fed my dog today. The mice need to be taken care of still. I don't think they have any food. But again, I'm thinking he's downstairs on the laptop, so he can use the laptop, and then I'll use the laptop afterwards. So it wasn't when you woke up this morning, it wasn't out of the ordinary that he wasn't there. What you, you, didn't wake, you didn't wake up this morning and go, oh, where's George? You woke up thinking, okay, George got up like he normally does mm -hmm. before me. And it's downstairs on the laptop looking for jobs. You, you had made a comment earlier that he's losing his teeth. Yes. What is I it? think that's, I, we don't know. I think that's one of the things subconsciously that has been really on his mind also is that he keeps losing his teeth. Like, he just would break off. He lost the whole molar or something in the back the other day while we're eating. It's and then he keeps talking about how his chest, and I, I'm blaming it on stress. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. I don't know what the teeth thing is. I know it can't be a good sign. You said he got into, you, you said an argument, but he had a bunch of, Facial injuries where he had reconstructive surgery. Yes. So he and his brother got into yes. this fight. Oh my gosh, it was horrific. Yes. Was it? Uh, any, I mean, usually when you have that much damage, it's more than just a fist fight. His brother hit him with something. No. Wait till you guys see Mo. 
Milo is a gorilla. Like, he's... It is possibly that's what's causing the teeth to get messed up? So they have to do work on his teeth or jaw. his jaw? Just his eyes. His eyes. Just the horrible sockets? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, they fixed his nose, too. Yeah, but... Now, the damage to his eyes, uh, is that still, I mean, is it noticeable, or...? No. Okay, so when they fixed the sockets, they, they came back and you couldn't tell that they had been damaged? I couldn't tell, but his children recognize it, where he, they say he doesn't look like the same dad. Okay. But to me, I, I never noticed it. No other damage to the jaw, the forehead, anything like that? No. It was just his eyes and his nose. You said he's been complaining of chest pains? He had mentioned it a couple times. Well, I'm just blaming it on stress, but again, I kept trying to encourage him with or without money, go to a walk-in clinic. Yeah. You'll eventually get a bill. But the teeth thing has been worrying me also, and I didn't want to say anything to him about it. But we were in the process of eating dinner, and a tooth comes out. That's scary to me, and a red flag, if you ask me. Well, this is the reason I was asking what, what you guys had for dinner last night. What has his, his dietary uh, habits been lately? I mean, he, he looks super thin to me. Now, yes. I don't know George, but he does not look like he's an average He weight. eats, believe it or not, like a horse. Like, he'll eat, uh, like, four or five times a day. Again, one of the things that has been concerning me, which you all will be the first people that I actually say this to, is his weight for the amount of food that he eats throughout the day, yeah. how he doesn't gain any weight. He and I and Lucas going up to Publix every mm -hmm. time we step on the scale, and he continuously loses weight. How well, I don't even want to step on the scale anymore. How long has this been going on for? Months. Months. So way before losing this job? Yes. It's been ongoing. I mean, I might not even say months. I can say at least a good year. Okay. And he eats like a horse. And you said you don't know that he's like this for me? I, since I've been him with him and known him, he's never done drugs. But I know him growing up in Philadelphia, he had a bad stint with marijuana and alcohol. If and when you talk to his children and or his ex-wife, she will tell you. His family will tell you. But since he's been with me, no, I have not. He's never done drugs. Now. Your phone, is it password protected or yes. uh, touch screen? It's does, password protected. Does um, George know the password as well? He doesn't know the code, but he does the face thing. Face, his face will recognize him. Okay. <clears throat> and the only reason why I have that is because I had lost two phones previously where I can't, I, before I had the passcode was somebody else being able to get into my phone because I lost it twice. So that's the only reason why I have it. Oh, like that's the reason you put a password on it yes. just in case you lost your phone? Yes. Okay. So do you <clears throat> recall what time you went to bed? I know that it was after midnight. Okay. What? How do you know that? Like, what makes you remember that? Because I walked up the stairwell, and we have a clock that's on top. Like, you see it as you're walking up the stairwell? Yes. <laughs> you have to turn the corner, and it's right here. Okay. And you don't remember when you went into the shower, around what time it was, looking at that same clock? Um, I didn't shower. I mean, I showered earlier in the day. No, when you, you said you hid in the shower when you were playing oh, and seek? Yes. Did you happen to look at that clock then and see what time it was? No, I just happened to look up <coughs> on my way. Going to bed? Or going into the rooms? Yes. Um, okay, so it was after midnight. Do you think it was before 1 a.m. though? Was it between midnight and 1 or... To be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, if I had to say, it was like 12.30-ish. Okay, and when you went upstairs, 
um, you and you and sorry, George were no longer having a conversation, laughing about the suitcase. You just decided to go upstairs. No, we were laughing about it. <laughs> okay, so you continued to joke about it as you were going upstairs, yeah. thinking he'll just get himself out, and then yes, that's why I didn't close it all the way. That's why I didn't close it all the way. I'm like, he'll be up here any minute now. But then, I guess I dozed off. And again, I'm thinking he's downstairs on the laptop this morning. Because he gets out of bed for most of the time. When you put him in the, or when he got, he got into the suitcase, yes. correct? So the suitcase now, if we're looking at it, what side was his head on when he got into the suitcase and you said to him? Was his head, like, on the, if we're looking and at it's it? it's right. like this. Uh-huh. His head was here. The hole was here. So his head was closer to where? Yes. Like, when you close it, his head was closer to where it's closed. No, that's where his head's here. This is him doing the finger thing over here. Great, so his head is closer to where you can close it. So when you close it, his head is on that side. Or his head is on the opposite side of where you close it. Because there's yeah. obviously an open, there's one in the suitcase is open, and then one it's shut. And it's obviously, the zipper's yes. on the opposite side. So if you do this, yes, mm -hmm. his head was here, where this the zip part was. Okay. Okay. But, again, that's why I didn't set that up all the way. Is there anything else that you think is important for us to know that we haven't asked you? I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know, again, if he had, like, a heart attack or an aneurysm or what. Like, I don't know what happened. Do you keep your phone on you? Like, is it always in your possession? No. Because it's a community phone between me and him. Like, if he needs it, most of the time it's on the kitchen counter. Okay. Where it's like, he knows that's where my phone is. Or, hey, I figured out talking to Lucas. Do you mind if I call my daughters? So it's... Right. It's our phone. No, I get it. I just, um... But no, I don't walk around with my phone on me all the time. Okay. Did you bring it upstairs with you when you went, when you were going to bed? No. No. Okay. So it stays downstairs. No. Or is downstairs with him? Yes, it was downstairs with him. <laughs> because I, that's how I heard my phone ringing and I knew it was Brian because he called over and over and over and over again, which is what he does. So you assumed it was him? But you didn't know Brian was calling you, but you assumed it was Brian. Yes, because he calls back to back to back to back to back. To back. Okay. And so I actually I don't answer. Okay. Okay, so your phone was downstairs. Yes. Can you raise your right hand for me? Do you promise and swear everything we've talked about has been true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Yes. Okay. But may I ask you though? Mm -hmm. Because I was telling you guys about it earlier. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm afraid for my life at this point. I'm, but I'm afraid. I don't, I don't know anything about your guys' history. Like, I don't know, other than the family not liking you, like. And they get upset because of the drinking. And just the things that we have gone through. And I, I know that they don't want him to be with me, but he and I... Are they going to Are they gonna tell me that he's an alcoholic? Probably. Okay. Are they going to tell me that you're an alcoholic? They'll say that, but they don't know. They assume. Okay. Why do they say that he's an alcoholic? Because of his track record in Philadelphia and all of the things that he has done. Cars that he's wrecked. Ex-wives, cars. He's been divorced twice. But, and he has, yes, they'll say that. Okay. They'll say that. But they don't know. They just assume. Okay. Well, if, I mean, if 
I mean, people have their opinions, okay? You can't not, there's nothing you can do about someone having an opinion and saying something like that. As far as what's going on here, I've told you, you know, prior, we don't know what happened. So I understand you feel like they're going to not accept, you know, what happened and they're going to think that it's your fault. But at this time, we cannot conclude and say anything differently. I know you talked about <coughs> you possibly going somewhere else for tonight. Um, you know, you have to do what you have to do to keep yourself safe. But at this point in time, no one has made a threat to you. No one has done anything. I said that so make me too again. Right. But we will obviously talk to them. And, of course, we're going to instruct them that this is an ongoing investigation. You know. <laughs> well, your son's with Brian and is going to stay with Brian. So we're going to cross that bridge when we get to it. I know you're fearful of it now. But nothing has happened to where you're you're in fear based off past history and what they think of you and how they threaten me all the time. <laughs> Do you have proof or is it all verbal? Like yes. would it be in your phone? No, it's verbal. Okay. It's verbal. So it's he said versus she said or she said versus she said. So yeah, hey, but they've been really nasty to me. <laughs> really nasty to me. It's gonna be a shock. It's, it's going to be, they're going to, everyone handles things differently. We're not going to leave there with them hooting and hollering. She's and going to be upset. And then they're going to all come up here. Okay. Well, who's going to collapse? I don't even know. His mom. His mom? What's, What's his mom's mom? name? Oh, um, Blanca. Is that her government name or is that just what you call her? No, I think that's her government name. <laughs> And you said she lives around here? They live down the street. When's the last time you... You said he doesn't even really talk to his family because he chose you over them. So when's the last time you've seen them or talked to him? I believe he did something with his brother a couple of weeks ago, but I don't go over there. Okay. Right. So if he goes over there, you do not go? No. But he did something with his brothers? I, I'm guessing so. I know that they come up to his job all the time. When he was working there? Yes. Okay. So they don't come. I mean, they have come over here and have just been completely disrespectful. Okay. And again, he ended up having to tell them, "Don't come over here if you're going to act like that and treat Sarah like that." Do you know their address? I have it inside. I know it's Baja Boulevard. Okay. I'm going to end my recording. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. One one quick question, just out of curiosity. I'm noticing your front door. It has a bunch of dents in it. What is that from? It, when we moved in, they were already there. So I don't see any other doors with dents like that. But whoever it was that lived here previously, I know it was a girl, but that was here when we moved in. This ends our recording 1747. While you were on the scene on February 24th, did you also make contact with Ryan Boone? Yes, before I spoke to Sarah Boone, yes. And did you have an opportunity to interview him? Yes, I did. While on scene, uh, did you also begin uh, the process of examining uh, the defendant's cell phone? I did not examine it myself, but I, um, we have a waivers and affidavits form that has a consent portion on it. Um, and so I did start doing the paperwork for um, that. You obtained consent from the defendant in this case? Yes, on scene to search through her cell phone. And uh, what time did you become aware of the videos on her cell phone? So um, a digital um, forensic investigator responded out to the scene, um, and she responded out... Um, a little after 7 p.m. And I would assume she probably started doing, you know, whatever she needed to do. And then a short time later, she came over and got my attention and explained, expressed to me that I needed to look at something in her phone. And these were the suitcase videos, correct? Yeah, they were two separate videos from the night prior. When you observed these videos, um, what actions did you take? When I observed the videos, um, I directed uh, the digital 
um, investigator to stop um, processing and downloading her phone any further, um, and that I was going to write a search warrant for her cell phone. Did you obtain that search warrant for her cell phone? Yes, it was signed by a judge the next day. And she was obviously able to uh, finish the, the digital uh, analysis, correct? Yeah, she was able to get like the full download as well. Um, she had already gotten the videos um, downloaded um, the night prior, but um, she was able to do whatever she does to get the full download. In the course of your interview with the defendant, you were relayed information that I guess uh, she had gone to pu Publix the previous day. Is that correct? In the interview? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. In the interview that we just listened to about going to Publix? In, in the course of speaking with her, did you learn that uh, she had gone to Publix? Yes. I was under the impression that... Um, <clears throat> That George had gone to Publix. Did you follow up with that Publix for surveillance video in this case? Yes, I went to the Publix to gather surveillance video. And were you able to find that video of them at Publix the previous day? Yes. And I'm, I'm first going to show you the video uh, taken from Publix on February 23rd, 2020 at approximately 12.15 uh, p.m. Ma'am, using the laser pointer, could you please identify the victim and the defendant on this video? This is the defendant, and this is the victim. Get Do you see the bottle of wine that was purchased in this video? Yes, it's right here. We could uh, move on to the publication of the second surveillance video. Can you identify uh, Mr. Torres for us in this video? Yes, he's right here. Is that the second bottle of wine? Yes. All right. In the course of your investigation, did you also interview uh, individuals from the apartment complex while they were living? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to also interview their neighbors as well? Yes, I did. Did you interview Juan Torres? Yes, the following day. And did you attend the autopsy in this case? Yes, the following morning. On February 25th of 2020, uh, did you set up a follow-up interview uh, with the defendant in this case? Yes, I did. And that was after you had attended the autopsy that morning, correct? The, the interview, the follow-up interview was to be conducted after the autopsy. Not necessarily set up, but it was to be conducted after the autopsy. I apologize if I misspoke on that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, was that interview uh, recorded? Yes, it was. Audio and video. And where did that interview take place? Central Operations at the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Okay, so after this, they played the two-hour interrogation video. And I think most everyone has already seen it, but if you haven't, go check out this video on my channel.
I made it about a year and a half ago. The audio and video should look a lot better there anyway. And unfortunately, I'm not allowed to post links. So you'll have to find it on my channel. Just click on the playlist tab and look for the Samsonite Succubus. Because that interrogation video is extremely important to this trial if you haven't seen it. But for those of us who have, I'm just going to skip over it and go straight to that last set of questions. Ma'am, did, did all of these events uh, you have testified to in regards to your investigation, did they all occur in Orlando, Orange County, Florida? Yes, they did. And ma'am, do you see the person today here in court who admitted to zipping up George Torres in the suitcase? Yes, I do. Do you see the person today here in court whose voice you heard on the suitcase video taunting George Torres? Yes. Do you see the person here today in court who admitted to you flipping George Torres while he was in the suitcase? Yes, I do. And do you see the person today here in court who admitted going to bed while George Torres continued to suffer in the suitcase? Yes, I do. Could you please identify that person by an article of clothing they're wearing? Yes, she's at the defense table in black and I guess a pinkish top. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witnesses identified the defendant? The record will so reflect. No further questions at this time. All right. Members of the jury, it is 5.59. I tried to get you out of here before 6. But that, members of the jury, will be in recess for this evening. We will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And again, I thank you for your attention and your sacrifice in this matter. So that's it for this one. The next one should be really good because Sarah herself is going to testify. I'll see you then. All right, we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you very much.